Before I introduce uh, Phil Paladin, I'd like to make an announcement of a startling discovery. Uh, over lunch, I went upstairs and was fooling around in the archives and have found a very small document here, a previously unpublished memorandum of Abraham Lincoln. And I want to read this for you today so that members of the press may take this down. It can be published in the Washington Post and all. And I think this will shed some light on many of the questions that have come up today. And I read, this is in Lincoln's handwriting. I loved Anne Rutledge. <laughs> but Joshua Speed sure was cute. <laughs> I believe profoundly in emancipation and support the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, but we'll settle for a good Major League Baseball team. <laughs> and then Mr. Lincoln goes on to say in this document, I admire Secretary Seward, I deplore Secretary Chase, and do not understand why Secretary Stanton wants me to go to the theater to see John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> this document, I believe, will completely alter our view of Abraham Lincoln and all subsequent interpretations of his life and career. Certainly, one Lincoln interpreter who has had a profound influence on our understanding of Lincoln as a president is the gentleman that I am now privileged to introduce, Philip Shaw Paladin, who for many years was professor of history at the University of Kansas, is the Chancellor Naomi B. Lynn, distinguished professor of Lincoln Studies at the University of Illinois in Springfield which means that Phil not only holds what I believe is the only actual titled academic chair in Lincoln Studies. I think that is correct, Phil. There's only one other possible close to that, but I think you are the only official Lincoln scholar, and that means the rest of us are amateurs. <laughs> yeah. But he holds that chair, and not only that, but he holds it in... Uh, that wonderful epicenter of so many great Lincoln events and studies in Springfield, Illinois. So, Phil, you are right at the magnetic pole of Lincoln studies. And uh, what, a great, uh, what a great position that is, but what an ideal person to have filling it. He received his Ph.D. from the University of Illinois, and his numerous awards and prizes, a number of which are listed here in your program, uh, are, are exactly the kind of thing that we have come to expect from the work as recognition of the work of Phil Paladin. He is the author of numerous books, and I can remember my encounters which, with each of them one by one as they appeared, um, going back to a covenant with death the Constitution, Law, and Equality in the Civil War Era, which is an examination of a number of critical legal writers and legal publications dealing with the constitutionality of the war. For many of us, the Civil War and its contests and battles was a military event. And Phil's book was a tremendous reminder that this was, after all, a civil war in a democracy. And therefore, debates over the Constitution and over the legality of aspects of the war, these were battles that had to be won fully as much as any battle on a battlefield. Phil is perhaps best known to those of us who are Lincolnites for his Presidency of Abraham Lincoln, a volume which appeared in 1995, in the American Presidency series, which is published by the University Press of Kansas. And I recollect the reading and reviewing of that book in which I said we may finally put James Garfield Randall away now because Phil Paladin's Presidency of Abraham Lincoln is now the book on the political life of Abraham Lincoln as President of the United States. 
In the larger context, his book, A People's Contest, The Union and the Civil War, which was published by Harper and Rowe, appeared in Harper and Rowe's prestigious American Nation series, and it is an examination of the war at home in the North. And for those who believe that the only excitement of the Civil War is to be found on its battlefields, once again, Phil Paladin directs our attention to the critical contests that took place in the Northern economy uh, on various aspects of Northern social conflict. And a wonderful book it is, which I will confess shamelessly to have, shamelessly to have mined for information in my classroom lectures and recommended far and wide. So we have as a speaker this afternoon someone who has spoken to the larger issues of Lincoln and pre the presidency, beyond that to the even larger issues of the Civil War, and whose topic today now takes us to perhaps the largest and most critical issue of all, perhaps the issue which Lincoln himself thought was the most profound issue that he had to address as president, and that is Lincoln and democracy. I can think of no better person to take us on an approach to that subject than Philip Paladin. Thank you, Alan, for that uh, introduction, which practically floors me. You might even save the audience from having to listen to me. <laughs> the topic, Lincoln and democracy on its face, appears simple. In part, it seems so because of the widespread, almost ubiquitous use of the word democracy. We have lived in what we call a democracy for so long and spoken of ourselves as living in one for so long that we may find it hard carefully to investigate the concept and its practice. Fish don't usually discover water. But it's important to climb out of the water to see what we have been swimming in, especially these days when there's so much talk about bringing democracy to the world. Just what is it that we are bringing? Is the democracy we experience exportable? We've had about 400 years of popular government in one form or another. Few other places can match that heritage. We really need to know what our democracy has been before we start to export it. So first we need to define and describe just what we're talking about. At its base, democracy is a government where the people of the society are the source of legitimate power and authority. The definition gains an ethical focus with an ancient definition that it is, quote, the lawful rule of the many in the true interests of the community. To some extent, Lincoln was engaged in an effort to add that dimension, as I hope will be clear from what follows. But right now, let's agree that there are several ways in which the people exercise and or express their authority. Democracy can be expressed in a plebiscite. The people vote to say yes or no to a particular measure or a particular person. It can be expressed in a participatory democracy where, as one author says, freedom is an endless meeting. We've been in a few of those. <laughs> there are good and bad democracies. The people voted the Ayatollah Khomeini into, into office. Famously, the people, too, chose Hitler. The ancient Athenian people governed both drunk and sober with mixed results, and Thucydides, Plato, and Aristotle were not impressed. And even our own democracy has features that challenge a belief that we, the people, rule the nation. Leaving aside as quickly as possible the 2000 election, look at Congress. In our democracy, the people's voice is heard through the representatives that we elect. And our most representative branch, the people as a nation, speak when they elect the 435 representatives to Congress. But of course, any individual vote can be and is swamped by the other individuals in the district. The census of Illinois in 2000 says that 19 congressmen represent over 12 million people. That is one representative for every 632,000 people. That is almost as many people as voted for Andrew Jackson nationwide in 1828. 
1860, the ratio was better. 243 U.S. representatives responded to about 31 million people, a ratio of about 120,000 people for each representative. As Madison and his friends in Philadelphia intended, this large ratio reduces the impact of any one interest group on its legislator. But that's another way of saying that the voice of the people is likely to be diffused enough as to be almost Delphic. The success of the system may rest in part upon it being Delphic. But I agree with Edmund Morgan that the people is a historic construct, a necessary fiction. There are, of course, folks out there who are people and perhaps even a people, but it's not always clear how many of their feelings are expressed in the governing process of an even the best democratic society we can devise. But surely such ambiguity vanishes when the topic is Abraham Lincoln and democracy. Well, let's not be blinded by familiarity. Of course, public discourse constantly links Lincoln to democracy. In a volume that has recently been reissued, something that came out originally in 1990, Harold Holzer helped Mario Cuomo of New York to produce a collection of Lincoln's writings that would be sold around the world. It was called Lincoln on Democracy. Lincoln has been called the savior of democracy. A recent collection of Lincoln quotations epitomizes the man by entitling the work of the people, by the people, and for the people. Our greatest Democrat, Roy Basler called him, He's also been in, described in images that exude democratic values. The man of the people who's quoted with pithy sayings like, God must have loved the common people. He made so many of them. It actually looks as though the, what Lincoln was talking about was common looking people and not the common people, but let that go. His war leadership has been described as a fight for democracy. But Lincoln is so often associated with the word and idea of democracy that few people stop to consider what the word might have meant to him or to the society he represented. His most remembered words are probably those from the last line of the Gettysburg Address. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain and that government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Scholars have debated which words he emphasized. Some say he emphasized of the people, by the people. Others say he emphasized the people. There is a possibility that he emphasized that government to give his words a specific focus on the United States. I happen to think that Lincoln emphasized government, and the rest of this essay will suggest why. It's certainly the case that he believed in a government of and for the people. And he believed as a legislator, or said he believed, that he would be guided by the will of his constituents when he knew that will. And this contrasted with some members of the Whig Party who believed that personal judgment was what voters elected them for, and thus there were times when lawmaker did what he thought was right, even though his district thought he was wrong. Lincoln was no fool. He spoke of the people on many occasions, and his own rise from very humble origins was a tale that told that any man's son could be elected president. It is not wrong to call Lincoln a believer in democratic government, but that designation needs refinement. What kind of democratic government did he believe in? Well, for one thing, he did not assume the goodness of the public will. It would be very surprising to have him say what Andy Jackson said, quote, Never for a moment believe that the great body of the citizens can deliberately intend to do wrong, end quote. Pure Jacksonian democracy frightened him, for it seemed to nurture instability like most idealized abstractions. Lincoln's faith in democracy was not abstract or ideal. It focused, it focused on the processes of American democracy. It focused on how democracy worked and not what it claimed to be. And above all, it rested on his devotion to the restraints of order, law, the Constitution, and history. The search for order was the foundation of Lincoln's personality. As a teenager, his good friend Matthew Gentry went insane before his eyes. Lincoln was so haunted by that experience that as late as 1846, 21 years later, 
he wrote a poem about his memories of his childhood years. The poem contained 24 stanzas. Over half of them were about Gentry's madness. Self-control meant also mastering his future by escaping from the often chaotic, backward, and poorly educated world of the subsistence farmer. After trying work as a storekeeper, he taught himself to be a surveyor, learning the mathematics of that job. Then he turned to the law and mastered the logic skills that that profession demands. And for over a quarter of a century of his life, Lincoln worked as a lawyer. Nothing else he ever did in his life took so much of his time. Whatever his scale, skills as a persuader of juries through bonhomie and emotional appeal, and they were formidable, Lincoln made a career in law with a powerful mind and considerable knowledge of the rules and rationalizations of law. That knowledge and skill translated into the political realm when he began debating against Douglas and gained success there by his logic as well as by his passion. Lincoln, despite his protest that he would not be a master, in fact, had become the master of his circumstances and much of his fate. In short, Lincoln spoke to the mind, believed in the power of reason, and feared that simple appeals to public passions would be demagoguery. He believed that the mind should control the heart and spoke to what he saw as the better angels of our nature by appeals to reason. Theories of democracy fit only tangentially into this worldview. Lincoln was not particularly interested in the concept of democracy. He didn't spend much time thinking or speaking directly about it. Look in the eight volumes of the collected works of Abraham Lincoln, and you will find that he uses the word democracy 138 times. He provides only one definition of what he means, and here it is in its entirety. Quote, as I would not be a slave, so would I not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this, to the extent of the difference, is no democracy. It must be noted that this statement doesn't come from any of his speeches. It's a fragment written on a sheet of paper about this big, sent to no one, appearing nowhere else in any of his speeches or writings. We have it because Mary Lincoln gave it to Myra Bradwell when Myra Bradwell helped free Mary from the asylum into which her son had put her. Given the records we have, it seems safe to say that Lincoln did not clearly define democracy for any assemblage of Americans in his lifetime. Did he even define it for himself? Well, perhaps he did in this little piece that Myra Bradwell got. <coughs> Something might also be gained by noting the frequency and the timing of his use of the word. All but 18 of Lincoln's uses were before he became president. In fact, in volumes 5 and 6 of the collected works, covering October 61 to October 63, he does not use the word at all. In volume 7, he uses it once. In the last years of his life, covered by volume 8, this goes from September of 1864 to April of 65. Lincoln doesn't use the word at all. In other words, from October 1861 until his death, Lincoln used the word democracy one time in the writings we have. By contrast, Lincoln uses words reflecting order many more times. Law is used 1,323 times, Constitution 1,437, and that totals... 2,760 times or 20 times more than the word democracy. There will be an exam on these numbers on <laughs> Monday. Excuse me. Now, 138 times, of course, are quite a few uses. But when you look at these uses, you find that Lincoln is almost always referring to the Democratic Party which was called by its supporters in those days, the democracy. Lincoln seldom had much to say good about that democracy, the racist, heron folk democracy of Andy Jackson, the triumphalist manifest destiny democracy of President Polk, the amoral popular sovereignty democracy of Stephen Douglas. <clears throat> in fact, Lincoln had an ongoing quarrel with democracy, a lover's quarrel, no doubt, 
but a quarrel nonetheless. I'm inclined to think that someone could write a book called Lincoln's Quarrels with Democracy, and the story would go, would rest on examples like this. In his famous Lyceum speech, January 1838, Lincoln spoke about democracy's dangers. He was responding to recent events when mobs had attacked bank directors in Baltimore, hanged a gambler on the Mississippi, killed Elijah Lovejoy for printing an abolitionist newspaper, murdered blacks in Mississippi, and burned a black man to death in St. Louis. Lincoln also spoke at a time when Whigs were attacking Democrats as demagogues and their leader Andy Jackson as, quote, a concentrated mob. Lincoln was certainly a Whig in his concerns about what Jacksonianism was spawning. As a cure for all this disorder, Lincoln offered no explanation or justification of popular will. Instead, he demanded that reverence for the law become the political religion of the nation. The words that you've probably heard more than once. Let every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his posterity, swear by the blood of the revolution never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country, never to tolerate their violation by others. Let reverence for the laws be breathed by every mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Quote, reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason, Lincoln said, must furnish all the materials for our future support and defense. And he repeated himself four years later when he spoke to the Temperance Society in Springfield, ending his address favoring temperance. Lincoln connected intemperance with the unleashing of fatal passions and called for those passions to be defeated by, as he put it, quote, in the happy day when all appetites controlled, all passions subdued, all matters subjected, mind, all conquering mind shall live and move, monarch of the world, glorious consummation, hail, fall of fury, reign of reason, all hail. Lincoln, therefore, seems to have been a man who respected reason and feared a democratic society where mind had failed to control passions. It was not altogether surprising that Lincoln opposed outbreaks of democracy in many of its forms during his lifetime. His attack on Jacksonian mobs found echo in his attacks on Douglas's popular sovereignty where citizens on the spot determined slavery's fate. Senator Douglas rested his argument for popular sovereignty on the abiding Democrat principle that popular majorities had the right to enact their will. The debates with Douglas were essentially about popular sovereignty, the right of local governments to make their own laws for their own safety and prosperity. Notice here that Douglas is emphasizing the rule of the many, whereas Lincoln is going to advocate the, in the true interests of the community. Lincoln placed equality ahead of democracy. Douglas argued that the people of the territory by majority votes could include or exclude slavery from their territory. Local democracies should speak authoritatively in the territories. But Lincoln insisted that Congress had control over the territories and could therefore trump majority will in the territories. Now one can say Lincoln's appeal to congressional authority might reflect his embrace of the government of the people over localistic state or territorial rights claims. But clearly, democracy as it was experienced in the territories was closer to the voice of the people there than was the outreach of Congress. It was less moral, but more democratic. But Lincoln brought in the heavy artillery to attack popular sovereignty. The Kansas-Nebraska Act wasn't just morally wrong, it unleashed disorder. The act was, quote, conceived in violence, passed in violence, maintained in violence, and executed in violence. Secession, which was surely a democratic movement in Dixie, obviously was something he challenged as, quote, the essence of anarchy. During the war, Lincoln hesitated very little in limiting the people's voice. He limited and at times stifled speech and press during the conflict, hardly so much as to make Lincoln a dictator, but sufficient to make civil liberties a major issue for the Democratic Party. This chilling of popular discussion ought to make us wonder at the extent to which Lincoln was the voice of unqualified democracy, and I mean unqualified in both senses. Other aspects of Lincoln's thinking raise doubts about his alleged commitment to democracy. We've all heard the famous saying, you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people 
all the time. Nobody's found evidence that Lincoln really said that. But assuming that something about the words seemed to fit, I invite you to think about what Lincoln, perhaps, is saying about most of the people, that they're fooled most of the time. Of course, there are other words that define democracy. What about the people? We link Lincoln with the people because probably of the Gettysburg Coda. Lincoln uses the word the people 1,282 times in the eight-volume collection. But between volumes one, in volumes one and four, one through four, Lincoln uses the word the people 1,080 times. And in volumes five through eight, he uses it 202 times. The more he matured, the less Lincoln found uses for the phrase the people. It seems possible to say that Lincoln was a man of the people, that he governed for the people, but he seems not to have been committed to a government by the people. His commitment was more to a government that governed the people and to the equality on which democracy rested and less on the people themselves. Yet for all these questions about Lincoln's democracy in the public domain, he seems to have been personally a Democrat in treating people as though he recognized their equality with himself, including especially African Americans such as Sojourner Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass. Here comes my friend Douglass, Lincoln shouted at the eight, in an 1865 inaugural reception, which in, including a huge room in the inaugural. I'm sure you all, many of you have been at the White House, and when you're in those, one of those big rooms, everybody's hanging around listening to see if the president says hiccups, burps, or says hi. Well, here's a whole crowd, and he sees Douglass coming into the back, and he says, here comes my friend Douglass. Douglas, come on over here. What did you think of my inaugural address? And Douglas says, sir, there's so many people waiting. He says, oh, no, there's no man's opinion I value more than yours. What did you think of it? And Douglas said, it was a sacred effort. And Lincoln said, thank you. But the dance had been done, suggesting that Lincoln's respect for African Americans was, or he wanted it to be thought, not, uh, not poorly at all, but quite well. Sojourner Truth recalled, I, was never, I never was treated by anyone with more cordiality and warmth. I felt I was in the presence of a friend. Lincoln also met in the White House with large numbers of ordinary people. Seward observed there never was a man so accessible to all sorts of proper and improper persons. What that has to say for Tripp's book, I won't even speculate. Lincoln's personal democratic instincts can be seen also in his attitudes about racial equality. Most recent scholarship on Lincoln has focused on his belief or lack of belief in equality. Lerone Bennett's editor of Ebony Magazine energized this debate in his 500-page book insisting Lincoln was a racist. Many people have demonstrated the flaws in Bennett's argument. But I think this debate, Lincoln honky versus egalitarian, does provide some insights into the question of Lincoln's democracy. Democracy rests on the idea of equality. A government of the people and by the people is one without a natural or established hierarchy. Governments by popular consent rest on the idea that all the people governed by that government have an equal right to be heard on how they are governed. That at least is the theory of our declaration. And because of the self-evident truth that all men, all people are created equal, we established our government on the consent of the governed. Lerone Bennett, notwithstanding, Lincoln's commitment to equality was strong and grew as he aged and became president. Early comments about not wanting blacks to vote or serve on juries were forgotten as sable soldiers and sailors proved their courage and discipline. During his presidency, Lincoln emancipated over two million slaves initiated the 13th Amendment, ending slavery all over the United States, recruited and utilized that black military arm. He advocated black voting, probably was on the way to protecting black civil rights in Dixie. Despite these public acts, recent authors have denied that Lincoln was personally an egalitarian. He told racist jokes, they point out. He enjoyed minstrel shows. These things are true. But I urge you to read Paul Zoll's book, Abe Lincoln Laughing, and to look up all the jokes in that 
on black people and see if you find them outrageous, slightly amusing. Um, none of them, I think, show an aggressive anti-black posture. There is a difference between being kicked and being stumbled over. Lincoln stumbled and seldom kicked. Did Lincoln like minstrel shows? Yes. But according to Lincoln Day by Day, he attended exactly two minstrel shows in his entire life. Now, the Day by Day is not the complete, but the evidence so far has Lincoln at two minstrel shows. Lincoln's commitment to equality is well established and secure. But I don't think we can confuse this egalitarian instinct with a faith in pure democracy. He understood the equation, the connection between equality and democracy. But his commitment to equality was in a legal sense, not in a belief that all men behaved with equal probity, that the pure-hearted Democrat deserved trust because theoretically he was the equal of all people. In his mind, equality was a proposition, not a goal achieved, and so was democracy. When Lincoln came to the presidency, excuse me, <coughs> he walked into a crisis in law and order, as someone wisely said. The newspapers and speeches of the time all spoke of enforcing the law, stopping disorder. They asserted that successful secession would loosen the bonds of order. It would produce successive secessions. Lincoln thought that that meant anarchy. To preserve that order, Lincoln willingly limited democracy. He denied the right of the people of Dixie to exercise the consent of the governed to rebel against a government that in their eyes threatened their rights. Elected by less than 40% of the popular vote, he suspended the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus without waiting for congressional consent. He accepted Secretary of State Seward's and then Secretary of Stanton's crackdown on freedom of the press by censoring and closing some newspapers. Lincoln countenanced the arrest of Clement the Landingham for making a speech challenging General Burnside's orders against disloyal speech. Lincoln defended that action with an ominous justification. The man who stands by silently while the fate of his country is being discussed cannot be misunderstood. If not stopped, he is sure to help the enemy. If not stopped from being silent while the fate of his country is being discussed. Now, Mark Neely has shown that most of the arbitrary arrests of the time were made as Union armies advanced into rebel territory. Few of those made by Lincoln stifled political dissent. But large numbers of Democrats used and followed Roger Taney's argument in Ex parte Merriman that Lincoln was the enemy, not the supporter of democratic speech. Certainly true that racism was a powerful card for the democratic, in the Democratic arsenal. But attacks on Lincoln's civil liberty actions were of substantial power, too. Otherwise, why would the Democrats have continued to use the accusation in their papers and platforms throughout the conflict? It's also true that Lincoln supported restrictions on the press. While the majority of opposition papers stayed open, calling Lincoln a tyrant, it was enough to make an example of the few to instruct others on the limits of dissent. Lincoln did not act directly, but he allowed Seward and Stanton to pursue their arrests and disclosures. And yet, there's another side to Lincoln's presidency that nurtured and enlivened democracy. In the simplest terms, he expanded the processes of democracy in two major ways. Expanding the processes of democracy now. First, he began the process of expanding the electorate to include African Americans. Emancipation the Union, Lincoln had played a major role in the two major prizes of the conflict, both foundational to democratic government in the nation. With the nation secure from successful secession, no state could ever again defy the constitutionally established ways peacefully to change the government. The beginning of William White's book on the, president, the rise of the president, 19, 1964, I believe it is, he opens with the line, talking about the election, it was silent as always. What a wonderful thing to be able to say about changing governments. It was silent as always. And by stopping secession, Lincoln helped us, helped us to maintain subsequently that tradition. And with slavery destroyed, the fundamental cause 
of defiance of the rule of law was gone. In addition, the leading source of attacks on civil liberties for whites and blacks was destroyed. People were now free to attack racism and bondage without being mobbed, at least in the North, and for a time in the South. They could print challenges to servitude without having presses destroyed or editors murdered. Lawmakers could speak on the floor of Congress without fearing a brutal, brutal beating. The imperative open discourse of the polity was words and not physical violence. Killing slavery unshackled the arguments and conversations on which democratic government lived. Lincoln helped emancipate more than slaves. His respect for go that for democratic government is perhaps best revealed in the final area where the nature of Lincoln's democratic ideals can be seen. I think it may have been a core idea, and it's best seen in the second inaugural address. In the greatest of his speeches, Lincoln never once mentions the people, nor democracy, nor the triumph of a free people's government over its enemies. But what it does focus on is a worldview, a frame of mind and a heart that is probably fundamental to any successful democracy. It is encompassed in a verse from the Bible, Micah 6, 8. O oh man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Lincoln had always questioned the notion that God gave clear commands to the righteous. His temperance address spoke of the need for reason and humility to inspire reform. When exhorted that God was on America's side, Lincoln said, I'd like better to get America on God's side. The country was perhaps an almost chosen people but it seemed arrogance to say that God wore blue or red, white, and blue. And in the second inaugural, Lincoln epitomized that view. At a time of triumph when throughout the North people celebrated and exulted and spoke of the victory of their ideas and how victory showed that God endorsed their ideas, Lincoln offered a warning. Avoid pride, triumphalism, and recognize that God's purposes transcend human understanding. Unlike Jackson's ringing endorsement of the popular will, never for a moment believe that the great body of the citizens can deliberately intend to do wrong. Lincoln asks for doubt and not arrogance. Lincoln's comments on humility and respect for higher authority provided a counter voice to democratic arrogance, an admonition to humility and doubt about self-righteousness. They reminded the nation that God might administer discipline punishing those, who's res those responsible for the sin of slavery, and he included both, both North and South in the indictment. The democracy of Lincoln's day was associated with a deep racism, an arrogant manifest destiny, and a pervasive self-glorification of the nation that made foreign visitors wince. But as the war wound down, Union armies had proven powerful, inexorable, in gaining victory. People easily believed that righteousness as they understood it, nay, as they knew it, should prevail. But Lincoln asked for humility and doubt and recognition that the Almighty has his purposes. It was a warning to a people, to a democracy, that he believed needed the instruction, the humble guidance of his leaders and of God himself, as God gives us to see the right. We might want to ask ourselves if that warning has been understood or can be relevant 140 years later. Maybe Lincoln's humility is the most significant thing to recall about his American democracy. Democracy without the rule of law and reason, lacking a sense of self-doubt, especially lacking a sense of self-doubt, may not be what is needed in the years to come. Thank you. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm open for questions. Can I remind people, uh, could I just remind you, if you're going to ask a question, to wait for the microphone to arrive in your hands. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have a I'd like to ask you, um, okay. how did Lincoln equate the Did you turn the microphone on? Hello? Uh, okay. 
how, how, how did Lincoln equate democracy with the sometimes competing concept of liberty? And that said, what is your take on the April, I think it was April or May 1864 address to the Baltimore Sanitary Commission, in which he said that when one speaks of liberty, we must remember that it does not mean the same thing to all people. How did Lincoln deal with, with the relationship between liberty and democracy? Um, I think he dealt with it by preserving the institutions, the, the institutions that he thought had been created to preserve liberty and a government resting on the ultimate authority of the people. And I don't see that he saw a clash between the two. Oh, I'm sorry. You need the machine to do something here, please. And I'm sorry, the second part of your question. Yeah. What is your take on his comments in April 64 in Baltimore in which he said that when one speaks of liberty, one does not necessarily mean the concept of liberty doesn't mean the same thing to all people? Right. And how does that tie into what you're talking about? Well, the concept of liberty clearly meant different things to the Confederacy and uh, to the Union. And to the Confederacy, it meant a certain constitutional structure which allowed states and locales more liberty than the, the, the North did. But I think those are the, that would be the major way, uh, and the, it, the major two examples that would come into his mind is that Lincoln believed that you have to have liberty. And you, liberty must be surrounded by the order and reason and legal institutions. Uh, otherwise, it is, as he says in his first inaugural address, or Jan July 4th address, clearly the, the essence of secession is anarchy. The essence of li too much liberty equals anarchy. I, I wanted to uh, focus you on the election of 1864 for a minute again. Um, I don't see how you reconcile Lincoln's decision to go forward with that election uh, in terms of what you were saying about his skepticism about democracy. I remember after the election, he said elections are a necessity. And I was thinking to myself, that's a word for democracy. Mm -hmm. That sounds to me of the spirit of Jackson's claim. And I wondered if you thought, at least during the course of the war, Lincoln grew more confident in democracy. And how else would you explain his decision to, uh, to go ahead with the elections? Okay. The electoral timetable, the electoral clock is going to keep ticking. And if Abraham Lincoln were to announce that there would be no elections this year, things are too tough, uh, he would have endorsed every Democratic slogan, epithet, uh, song, dance, whatever the Democrats had said about Lincoln's lack of interest in, interest in liberty would have been endorsed thunderingly by the determination not to have an election. Early in your uh, talk, you uh, quoted Lincoln as being uh, very much uh, on the side of adherence to law. Mm -hmm. What do you think his reaction would have been to civil di disobedience as a way of changing laws? He was not too much in favor of that, as we can see again by the secession crisis, that is a civil disobedience. Some people have argued that this was a, um, a, a, a show and not an actual uh, secession threat, but an effort to persuade the government that unless the defenders of slavery had their way, uh, things, would, things would come apart. Is that responsive? Right. Lincoln's idea about revolutions is that you have to have a revolution for the right purpose. And a revolution can be uh, for a wrong purpose. And he said the, the secession revolution is a, is a revolution that is simply a wicked exercise of physical force. But in the case of making a revolution to secure the principles and the ideals that all men are created equal, uh, perhaps another thing is tolerated. More disorder is tolerated. Whether he believes that uh, civil disobedience is imperative 
in a republic? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. I mean, <laughs> How much uh, of Lincoln's ambivalence, as you see, ambivalence to democracy stems from his Whig Party uh, roots? And have past writers like James Randall tried to overcompensate by turning Lincoln into sort of a Jeffersonian Democrat? Hmm. Um. I'm not. I haven't re been reading my Randall recently, so I can't. Uh, I can't be too responsive uh, to that. Um, on the question of whether he, his Whiggishness, his Whiggishness helped make him a apostle of law and order, I think that's exactly right. Uh, I think he was a Whig because of that, uh, and, and because the party accorded itself with his wishes and uh, was established itself as the party of law and order and stability. And, but that it, he fit right into that party with his uh, personal experiences of, of wanting order and stability. Um, and uh, so the two, his Whig party antecedents and his personal need for a sense of order and discipline, I think one fits right on top of the other. It's on. You just hit. All right. The light is showing, so it must be on. The, uh, with the fact that, that Abraham Lincoln and, and his generation was in the lifetime after the invention of European socialism and Karl Marx and all of that, if we take what our Europe, European friends would say, social democracy, Professor, in your extensive experience with, with Abraham Lincoln, how close do you think, granted with his friendship with Shures and, and some of the other great Europeans who visited with him, how close do you think he was to that social democracy kind of definition of democracy? The power of slavery, uh, the awesome power of slavery tended to warp the ways in which people uh, people of the North or, or Abraham Lincoln could move for a very advanced social revolution. Um, to have killed slavery was such, such an endeavor and such an accomplishment that going beyond that, at 620,000 lives have already been lost, would have been taking a, an, an enormous step. Uh, another thing, uh, Lincoln is not... He's living in a semi-industrializing, modernizing north. But he is not clear or says he is not clear about the social costs of this free enterprise system of the right to rise and things like that. Um, I take a point that was one of the earlier speakers made that Lincoln was very troubled, according to Herndon, by uh, George Fitzhugh's Sociology for the South and Cannibals All as a sign that Lincoln was aware that there was a price to be paid in revving up the North so it would be willing to, it would be successful in winning the war. Um, so he knew that there were children in Massachusetts factories who were started to work when they were seven and eight years old. But as in almost every war, you have to use the guys who have the money and the expertise to create the huge mechanisms of transportation and uh, machinery, et cetera. So um, Lincoln might have just had a trade-off to the extent that he would have thought of a social democracy in the sense that the government have had the responsibility to help people uh, who were in dire straits. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau might be a sign of that, but Lincoln's emphasis is on, uh, is sort of replicates his own experience that the, he wants to, wants the people, the blacks to vote who have, who are very intelligent, who sort of shown themselves to be bright, and who have fought. And so there's a character element in all of this too, which again makes it uh, unlikely that Lincoln would have bought in to a social revolution. And after all, what, what, the Communist Manifesto is 48. 
So this hasn't been around too long. I don't know how soon it's translated. I have the last question. Yeah. Um, Washington's farewell address as president, he discussed, you know, at length about union and liberty is pretty much one and the same thing. And, you know, the trials that Washington had with the Jeffersonian Democrats as president. Do you think Lincoln understood that what Washington was saying, that, you know, all these sections in the country need each other, that liberty and union, we, we, we did become a union because, because of the Declaration, and all, it's all held together. Do you think Lincoln understood Washington's example um, from his standpoint politically? Lincoln often mentions Washington as, uh, as, as his beau ideal along with Henry Clay. Uh, did Lincoln understand the importance of liberty in, and union? Yeah. Uh, they, there, they had created a unified United States of America to the extent necessary to beat the English. Uh, the English are still floating around out there, uh, still potentially dangerous, and one needed union in order to preserve the liberty that was established under this government. Um, so in, in international relations, yes, I think he understood that. But everybody was sensitive to the power of state sovereignty and uh, the power of secession. Um, but um, I guess I'd stop, that, stop with that. Everybody was sensitive to the, the need for that you were walking a line in a free government between liberty and order, and you needed to maintain all the elements of order and discipline and unity in order to keep the place from flying apart. We are, we are a dangerous, sort of a dangerous world here. It's al it's, it almost goes back to the concept of republicanism, that the kind of people necessary for a free nation are people who are self-sacrificing, who put the good of the state above themselves, but that man is inherently selfish. So... Where are you going to, how are you going to keep this dangerous critter being the right kind of person to maintain a republic? And Lincoln's wanting to know how you maintain the e equal liberty under some limit, some degree of the rule of law. Shall the government be too strong for the liberties of its people or, but n or not strong enough to fight for its own preservation is a question that Lincoln asks in July of 61.